Dr. David Groves is a physicist in the UK and a specialist in image processing. I've been involved in image analysis for 25 years now. I did my PhD developing holographic computer techniques for analyzing images. My company, Quantic Image Processing, use these image processing techniques to extract three-dimensional information from two-dimensional images used in industry and used in medicine. The NASA pictures that I've analyzed contain many inconsistencies, a whole core of which have no rational explanation or excuse. David Groves of Quantec Image Processing, using the technological resources at his command, has traced this secondary light source and been able to calculate exactly where an additional light was placed in relation to the camera. If you magnify the photograph and look at the boundary of the porch through which the astronaut is exiting, you can see a fine shadow line around the porch perimeter. This shadow line shows that you have a well-localized source of light to the right of the camera. Most interestingly, there is a hot spot on the heel protector of the astronaut's right-hand boot. This allows us to do some quantitative measurement. We had access to one of these boots with a heel protector from which we could measure very accurately the curvature of that heel protector. Knowing again the focal length of the camera lens, the position of that hot spot on the heel protector and the orientation of the boot in the photograph, we could determine the light path to that source of illumination. The light source is between 24 and 36 centimeters to the right of the camera, an ideal position for artificial lighting. So it's now been established beyond argument that an artificial light source was used. We even know where it was placed for the photography of this important sequence of Aldrin descending the ladder. At this point, you might say, well, surely they can use extra lighting if they want to. What's wrong with that? According to NASA, the astronauts didn't take any lighting to the moon. And we can prove that there was no lighting. The TV coverage of this event demonstrates this fact. In the TV footage, we can see Armstrong standing at the foot of the ladder as Aldrin descends, supposedly taking the still photos, which are the official record of this event. Aldrin is in darkness. Aldrin is not lit. Yet the published still photo sequence clearly indicates the use of an artificial light source. Did Armstrong really take these still photos during Aldrin's descent on the moon? In our opinion, probably not. We propose that this is a completely restaged, or rather pre-staged, set of studio photographs. So, wherever the Aldrin descending the ladder sequence of stills was taken, an artificial source of light was deployed. I know that they had no extra lightning, uh, no flashes or things like that. So, uh, it has to be the reflection from the surface. That the astronaut will be adequately lit whilst in the shadow side of the LEM, solely from natural light or earthshine bouncing off the lunar surface, is an argument advanced by others as well as Jan Lundberg, but it's untenable. To make a direct comparison, the surface of the moon on average has the ability to reflect light from any source whatsoever at whatever distance from its surface to the same degree as Ashveld does on Earth, on average approximately 7%. In other words, whatever the strength of the light arriving on the lunar surface, whether by natural or other means, the ability of the average lunar surface to reflect light remains constant. Indeed, the lunar surface luminosity is so low it doesn't even manage to illuminate the shadow side of the smallest rocks, as we've already seen. Here's another good example. The sun, or prime light source, is behind the LEM. This picture is taken into the light, so the side of the craft nearest to us should be absolutely black, but has been filled in with a generous amount of light. Particularly obvious is this piece of equipment illuminated from the front. That sequence of images on the lunar surface, taken mainly by Armstrong, of course, on that with that one camera, which was incidentally left on the moon, so it's going to be a marvellous relic for when we eventually get back there, of course. The film came back. That film 
probably I would say has never ever been bettered whether on the moon or subsequently almost every one of those relatively small number of images taken by Armstrong appeared to be splendidly composed you remember the classic face on picture of Audrin with his visor reflecting the entire landing scene the lunar module the flag the TV camera and Armstrong taking the picture uh, reflected in the visor. It's a marvellous picture. With that comment, H.J.P. Arnold has led us to another of the classic Apollo 11 images. In fact, one could say that this particular shot conveys the very essence of the entire Apollo program. Yet this classic picture of Aldrin has several very serious problems. Aldrin cannot be standing in natural sunlight in this image because the surface around him is not evenly lit, as would be the case with light from the sun. This scene is obviously lit with uneven artificial lighting. The prime source of light is over Aldrin's left shoulder. The light is emanating from this direction. We know this is so because we can see what photographers call fall-off in the top left, the top right and the left foreground. This fall-off effect is the name given to darker areas caused by lighting a subject with a non-uniform source of light. Lighting that does not have enough spread as this false color version particularly reveals. Secondly, we can see that our old friend the fill-in light has again been used to illuminate the suit detail on Aldrin's right-hand side, the left of the picture. The camera position itself is also in doubt, for we seem to be looking down on the astronaut. How can we tell if that's so? Well, recalling the large centre reticle cannot be anywhere but in the centre of the image, we're surprised to find that this reticle is over the lower part of Aldrin's right leg. The Hasselblad camera was attached to the astronaut's chest at the time, and so the centre of the image should be over the abdominal area of the subject. This lower leg position for the centre reticle strongly indicates that the camera was in fact positioned at a higher level. As this graphic demonstrates, the centre of the picture can only be over the subject's lower leg if the camera is positioned at eye level and then tilted down. The camera height and tilt angle was calculated by David Groves. This fact represents another serious problem. The reflection of this scene mirrored in the astronaut's visor shows the astrophotographer with his camera clearly positioned at chest level, which actually cannot be. So this false reflection must have been composited or painted in over the original image. The reflection we see in the visor cannot be that of the photographer of the image. The horizon is a very good datum. On the moon, the horizon effectively acts as a spirit level. We know it's about 89 degrees from the true vertical. Therefore, the position of the horizon cutting through the image of the astronaut shows us the level of the camera when the picture was taken. And if we look at the picture, we can see the horizon cuts very nicely at face level the camera taking the photograph could have been positioned on the chest of an astronaut and that astronaut could have been about two foot higher than the astronaut that was being photographed. To this end we could analyze the shadow in the image. Basically the information we have and can make use of is we know the width of the visor in the image, the focal length of the lens used on the camera, Using that information, we can analyze the shadow of the astronaut's left leg and determine between the two astronauts the variation in height of the surface. The variation in height of the surface between the astronauts is typically a few inches. It would have to actually be two feet to explain the incorrect positioning of the camera when the image was taken. I'll be honest with you, I think that's pseudo-scientific, nitpicky claptrap. And again, I don't know why we should spend even a moment uh, trying to judge that. But as we've seen, there are indeed crucial problems with the photographs. This is the point. The so-described nitpicky, pseudo-scientific claptrap is not pseudo at all. The analysis has been undertaken based on the laws of physics. Fortunately, the information encrypted within these images has survived the voyage across three decades and is now being decoded by people like Percy and Groves. The proof is in the details.